And Bill Buckley, in his book, had a tremendous influence on Frank Shodoroff and did set the tone for ISI over the years. And for that reason, I believe that his book, God and Man and Yell, is probably one of his best books. Well, Bill doesn't need any introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. William F. Buckley, Jr. Uh, Mr. Riley, ladies and gentlemen, you've had a very long day on the theme of recovery. And no doubt before too long, you will think most anxiously about recovering your sleep. <clears throat> it has been for us today something on the order of a great symposium with actors, many of them with lines and thoughts delivered as striking as Plato's. They are in any event among the few key people on whom so many of us depend for guidance and what brings them here today is the 35th anniversary of a small institute whose paternal figure, as has been remarked, was my old friend Frank Todorov, but whose uh, animating force for most of this period, never mind how, how, how he attempts to obscure it, has been our guest of honor, Victor Milioni. I have told the story before but I think it worth repeating. Uh, Frank Sadorov published, um, as uh, previously remarked, about 40 years ago, a pamphlet which he called uh, A 50-Year Plan. He calculated that at least a half century would be needed to displace the dominant uh, shibboleths of socialism. That pamphlet was greeted so enthusiastically that he set out to organize a society. Organizing anything was alien to the vaguely anarchical spirit of Frank Zadaroff. So he told me one day that I would be the president of what he called the Intercollegiate Society of Individualists. It was, in my hab it was my habit in those days and after to do anything Frank asked. And so for a while I was president of ISI. Then one day I got a note from him, a note that sticks easily to the memory. It said, Dear Bill, you're fired. <laughs> I've decided a Jew will do better as president of ISI, so I've appointed myself Love Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and he reigned for a very little while because he fell ill and dispirited, but with help from Providence, he gave the organization a fresh president, not Jewish to be sure, which may be why ISI is always broke. <laughs> but so are we all always broke with the possible exception of Ed Fulner, <laughs> who, who renounced the vows of poverty some years ago. <clears throat> and in a quiet way, Victor set out to be of service to a half century's young men and women. He didn't make it through the 50 years, which is why the resourceful, witty, learned and imperious Bob Riley is here. <laughs> the original idea was that by the year 2001, a Tartaros 50-year plan would be consummated. Sometimes it seems hardly possible, but the human mind can transform discouraging data. Thus, the last time I visited with Malcolm Muggridge, and he spoke of the prevalence of the anti-life movement, he suddenly stopped in his melancholy turned to me and said, but do you realize, Bill, there is a bright side to it. I calculate that at this rate, by the year 2020, there won't be any Swedes left. <laughs> <laughs> you have heard uh, <coughs> Gerhard Niemeyer, <coughs> my mentor and friend, uh, Charles Kessler, my brilliant uh, co-editor, the learned uh, Ralph McInerney, whose conceit is that serious men can also write thrillers. <clears throat> the great sage of Castle Russell Kirk, the talented and thoughtful sculptor Reed Armstrong, four of whose sculptures adorn my house, and Constantine Menges, the scholarly witness to the ultimate satellization by the Soviet Union of the bureaucracy of the Western world. And in just about six minutes, you will hear from a heroic figure <clears throat> 
unlike most of us who have suffered only vicariously from the torments of the century, <clears throat> has had direct experience with the monster, but who, like Whitaker Chambers, has not returned from hell with empty hands. In reflecting on the theme of recovery, I thought to point to the recovery of a faculty conspicuous for its torpor. It is, of course, true that there is much to be discouraged by, and the day's speakers have reminded us of this, but true also that we have only to pick up this morning's newspaper. Riots threatened and thwarted in Algeria, starvation in Ethiopia and the Sudan, the high possibility of the reinvasion of Estonia, a purge announced in Yugoslavia, a threat of military government in Armenia, the eternal insecurity of life in Russia and in China, to know that, as the British voyager said over 100 years ago, the land here is bright, almost surrealistically bright by contrast, uh, plagued, yes, by vicissitude, but nevertheless the republic for which we stand, as the school children of Massachusetts are not encouraged to say. <laughs> we need... We need, I think, to cultivate the faculty for gratitude. When I was 13 years old, I was chaperoned here and there, along with two sisters of about the same age, about the greater environs of London. My music teacher, whom I loved and still do, was by my side when I went to the counter of a little souvenir shop in Stratford-on-Avon and paid out three or four shillings for Shakespearean sundries I had picked up. An elderly lady took my money returned me some change, and then withdrew from the display case a tiny one-quarter-inch uh, edition of Romeo and Juliet, and smiling, gave it to me a gift. Whereupon, I took the sixpence she had just before given me in change and deposited in her hand a reciprocal gift. Once outside, I received a stern rebuke from my teacher I had done an offensive thing, she told me. A gift is a gift I must learn, she went on, to accept gifts. They are profaned by any attempt at automatic reciprocity. Many years later, I read in a biography of Abraham Lincoln about an episode that had briefly convulsed the receiving line at the White House. A lady in that line, after taking the president's hand in formal greeting, thrust forward with her left hand a huge bundle of long-stemmed roses, depositing them, in effect, all over Mr. Lincoln. The president and the receiving line were immobilized. Abraham Lincoln smiled and said after the briefest pause, are these really for me? Yes, his guest replied, beaming. In that case, the president said, I can think of nothing that would give me more pleasure than to present them to you. <laughs> the flowers were returned. There were smiles all around. The lady took back her roses and the line moved on. That is an unusual, perhaps a singular exception to my music teacher's injunction against the social sin of reciprocal gifts. Few people, in public life or private, have managed such extemporaneous grace. Many years went by, and then only a fortnight ago, I received on my trusty electronic MCI a message from a friend, a computer expert. He said, that the retrieval system I had yearned for, one which would permit me to locate individual book titles in my library via my computer, had been completed. He had worked on it in the interstices of his busy schedule for over a month. It is yours, his message read, as a belated Christmas present. Impetuously, I flashed back on my computer screen that I insisted he send me a bill for professional services one minute later, my mind traveled back, and I was again a little boy at a souvenir shop at Stratford, embarrassing a kindly woman who had attempted an act of generosity. There and then I shed the grown-up equivalent of tears at my awkwardness. But as I reflect on it, there is a distinction. The gift automatically repaid <clears throat> in roughly equivalent tender is corrupted. It ceases to be a gift. And the philanthropic impulse is traduced. The unrequited gift, in Burke's phrase, is one of the unbought graces of life. Any effort to repay vulgarizes the offering 
and one risks repaying a kindness with an act of aggression. But a country or a civilization that gives us such gifts as we dispose of cannot be repaid in kind. There is no way in which we can give to the United States a present of a Bill of Rights in exchange for its having given us a Bill of Rights. Our offense, the near universal offense, remarked by Ortega y Gasset as the fingerprint of the masses in revolt, is that of the Westerner, rich or poor, learned or ignorant, who accepts without any thought of any debt incurred the patrimony we all enjoy, those of us who live in the free world, the numbing, benumbing thought that we owe nothing to Plato and Aristotle, nothing to the prophets who wrote the Bible, nothing to the generations who fought for freedoms activated in the Bill of Rights. We are basket cases of ingratitude, so many of us. We cannot hope to repay in kind what Socrates gave us but to live lives without any sense of obligation to those who made possible lives as tolerable as our own within the frame of the human predicament God imposed on us, a lack of gratitude to our parents who suffered to raise us, to our teachers who labored to teach us, to the scientists who prolong the lives of our children and parents when disease strike them down is spiritually atrophying. We cannot repay the gift of the Beatitudes with their eternal searing meaning. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But our ongoing failure to recognize that we owe a huge debt, which can be requited only by gratitude, defined here as an appreciation of the best that we have, and a determined effort to protect and cherish it, marks us as the masses in revolt, in revolt against our benefactors, our civilization against God himself. It is for this reason that we have a special joy in giving gratitude for 35 years' work under the resolute and inspiring guidance of one man, of an institute that seeks to keep alive the monuments of the past and to do them honor and to keep fresh in the memory what they have done for us. To fail to experience gratitude when walking through the corridors of the Metropolitan Museum when listening to the music of Bach and Beethoven, when exercising our freedoms to speak or to give or to withhold our assent is more than to profane spontaneous generosity. It is to decline to express however clumsily, to feel however coarsely, our gratitude for the fruits of genius, for generosity human and divine, for the great wellsprings of human talent and concern that gave us Shakespeare, Adam Smith, Abraham Lincoln, Mark Twain, our parents, our friends, Victor Milioni, and yes, the old lady in Stratford. We need a rebirth of gratitude for those who have cared for us, living and mostly dead. The high moments of our way of life are their gifts to us. We must remember them in our thoughts and in our prayers and in our deeds. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Buckley. Vic complained that my introduction of him was too short. All right. No, I just have one brief story. When Vic took over ISI after uh, Frank Chodorov passed away, Frank Chodorov, as many of you know, was a pretty hardline libertarian. And when Vic Milioni became president of ISI, he took it in what is known as a more traditionalist direction. So at a meeting, I believe it was of the Philadelphia Society, Vic, a leading libertarian, perhaps Murray Rothbard, rose up and said, Vic, if Frank Chodorov were alive today, and saw the direction in which you have taken ISI, he'd turn over in his grave. 
So Vic, having a deep respect for the libertarian philosophy, got up and said, Murray, when Frank Chodorov was alive, he ran this organization the way he wanted to. Now that I'm president, I'm going to run it the way I want to, and sat back down. <laughs> QED, the refutation of uh, a particular radical strain of libertarianism. Vic, I'll try to carry on in that fine tradition. If without the splendid eloquence of our first president, Phil Buckley, who gave really the uh, short form introduction of our next speaker, Vladimir Bukovsky, he has come from hell, not empty handed. I have had the privilege of uh, knowing Vladimir for a few years. I've never told him this because we have since become friends. But when I first met him, I was absolutely delighted that I was so overwhelmed with work that I couldn't be nervous. And the reason I would have been nervous is that I had followed his career from 1968-69 to the point at which I met him when I was serving in the uh, Reagan administration. And uh, in the late 60s, if you remember, it was a less than happy time for this country. I was uh, serving in the army at this time when I saw this particular program, and of course there were no heroes left. The streets of Washington were being trashed. And uh, I happened to see a news report that was so unusual I took notes, and I took down the name Vladimir Bukovsky, and from ever uh, since that point, I began tracing his career whenever his name was mentioned in the newspaper. Because the first time I heard of Vladimir Bukovsky, when he was still, well, let us say, an even younger man in his early 30s, he had spent roughly half his life in the belly of the beast. Half of his life had been in the Gulag Archipelago. And he had been let out for a short recess. And during this short recess, he grabbed a Western newsman and took him to a secluded part of a park in Moscow and told him, set up your camera. I'm going to start speaking. And this was what was recorded and this what was what was shown on Western television because this Western newsman, one of the rare of that breed, succeeded and seeing the importance of this and also getting it out of the Soviet Union. And Vladimir uh, said, if I may roughly paraphrase from what I very clearly remember at that moment, said, I'm out for the moment. I will be arrested again, as he was. And I am not sure that after my next experience in prison, I will any longer have the use of my reason because of the application of sulfazine and other drugs shot into the veins of the recalcitrant to alter them mentally and psychologically. And so Vladimir Bukovsky said, I would like to use this opportunity to tell you the truth while I still have the full capacity of my mental powers. And he began describing the true nature of the Soviet Union. And I watched transfixed and said to myself, where are the heroes? Are there no heroes? Here is a hero, a man of extraordinary moral strength and courage and stamina. And so, as I mentioned, I continued to follow his career, which he later documented in his book, To Build a Castle, My Life as a Dissenter. And thank God, after some 14 years in the gulag, he was released in an exchange 
for the head of the Chilean Communist Party. On a lighter side, I asked Vladimir how he enjoys his present situation because he's living in England. And he said, well, there's a good side and a bad side. I said, I know. Tell me about the bad side. He said, well, you know, I uh, am used to privation. And England is a spec There are no guests from England here this evening. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> Mr. Buckley, what do I do now? <laughs> I will modify the quote and say that he said it is a somewhat in uncomfortable country in terms of amenities, and so therefore he found himself very comfortably ensconced in Cambridge. So without further ado, I present uh, Vladimir Bukowski. Well, thank you, Bob. I still flatter myself that I'm in full capacity of my mental abilities <laughs> after all these speeches and the dinner. So, uh, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to address the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, 31st anniversary, particularly because it is dedicated to the subject of renewal, of recovery we experienced in recent years. My friends know that I always grumble about the shortcomings of the West in general and of the United States in particular, about wishful thinking and short-sightedness, lack of political will and of leadership. But uh, of course I know that the things were much worse 10, 15 years ago, and that current state of affairs is a great improvement. In this sense, the West reminds me of an old beggar from a popular Russian joke who was walking down the street one rainy day, wearing one, only one shoe, but singing with happiness. Well, of course, people were agitated, they were shouting at him, what's the matter with you, you're crazy? Look, you have lost one shoe. Oh no, replied an old man cheerfully, I've just, had, I've, I've just found one. <laughs> I remember, for example, when I was just uh, expelled from the Soviet Union 12 years ago, only Maoists and Trotskyites in Europe were not afraid of being anti-Soviet. Shortly after my expulsion, I was invited to speak at a dinner organized by a fringe group of the British Conservative Party, at that time in opposition, where among other speakers was scheduled the leader of that group, Margaret Thatcher. And my God, I was vehemently attacked in the British press for associating myself with a lunatic right-wing fringe. <laughs> Today, as you know, the Thatcherism is the mainstream political thinking in England, if not in the whole world. Of course, I remember the time when practically every Western government would openly negotiate with terrorists and give in to their demands, uh, quite unashamed, unashamedly uh, paying ransom to the international gangsters. Some still do, but at least they are compelled to do it in secret, and whenever it comes into public eye, it becomes a scandal. Only in the last few years, we have seen the remarkable signs of the moral recovery of the West, such as liberation of Grenada, such as growing support for freedom fighters in Afghanistan or in Nicaragua. We have seen the return of a true meaning to the word of solidarity. And of course, we can definitely say that uh, Europe is recovering from its post-war illness and the United States is recovering from its post-Vietnam war syndrome as well. But let's think of it, it did not happen on its own. And I believe many in this audience tonight have contributed heavily into this recovery. I remember, and we just discussed it with Bob during this dinner, how we tried to get together a petition of Europeans supporting the drive supporting or appealing to the United States Congress to support Nicaraguan Contras. And Bob did know that in Europe it cost us dearly because we had to drag everyone to do that. Families fell apart, friendships fell apart. And at one point I, did, I, I felt that we wouldn't make it unless Bob guarantees me 
that the United States president would receive them. And Bob couldn't guarantee that unless he knew who would be coming. So we stuck with that for a while, and then I had to tell to Bob that unless he guarantees that, the whole thing will fall through. So by some miracle, he managed to get that, and uh, probably 30 years later, he will describe it in his memoirs, how he, did, how, how he managed. But we pulled it through, and believe me, this renewal we are, we are talking about tonight did not come on its own accord. It was made by people like Bob. It was made by the small groups like yours, by people like Bill Buckley, who dedicated all his life to that renew. But nowhere this recovery is so obvious as in the Soviet Union today. One might say it became the most anti-communist country on earth. When 25 years ago we have, we have uh, started our movement there, we were just a handful of youngsters, and most of us were immediately locked into lunatic asylums for demanding glasnost, which at that time was regarded as a completely cra crazy idea, and by now became an official policy of the Soviet Union. Official Soviet press repeats now almost word for word what we used to say for 25 years, and what would be branded as anti-Soviet agitation and propaganda just a few years ago. The very word communism practically disappeared from their official language. Instead, they prefer to speak about socialism, which they claim is synonymous with the market economy. <laughs> Recently, a leading Soviet economist has attended an international conference in Spain and had a tremendous quarrel with his left-wing European colleagues because he supported privatization of the state-owned industries conducted by the British government. As a result of this, this faithful son of the Communist Party was publicly called a reactionary. And in replying to that, he said that the Western left, and I quote, is depressingly out of date. <laughs> well, you can say that again. In fact, the things went so far that, as I've been recently informed, Lenin suddenly disappeared from his tomb. So the KGB team duly searched the whole surroundings and somehow managed to find in between the pillows a small note, going to Zurich, <laughs> to start all over again. <clears throat> but this is only an official side of the Soviet life. Unofficial developments went, went much further. There are thousands of unofficial associations, movements, groups, publications, some of which are openly anti-communist, like Democratic Union, which proclaimed itself an opposition party. Just before November 7th, the traditional Soviet celebration of the Bolshevik Revolution, this party distributed thousands of leaflets across the country with an appeal not to celebrate it any longer. It says, Despite loud speeches about perestroika and glasnost, democratization and restoration of historical truths, we still celebrate every year an anniversary of anti-popular October coup d'etat. It is a high time to stop and ask ourselves, what do we celebrate? A creation of a dictatorship which led to destruction of many millions, and not only during Stalin period, but right, right away from the, those days in October. The Red Terror, the Civil War, were natural consequences of the Bolshevik usurpation of power. Crushing of the popular uprisings in Tambov and Kronstadt, creation of a concentration camp in Solovki, hard labor on the North Sea Canal, and uh, there, are, uh, there are hardly good causes for jubilation. In the General Secretary's speech, once again contrary to historic truths and common sense, it is repeated a praise to our achievements. Indeed, we achieved a lot. We have created an empire inspiring disgust and fear of all nations. An empire which can only produce weapons instead of consumer goods. We can neither feed nor clothe ourselves. And this is not a small group of conspirators. It is a party, an organization with branches in every industrial city in the country and with a following of many thousands. Above all, what they write in this leaflet is not just their opinion, but an opinion of millions 
Even in the, in the tiny Siberian village of Komsomolsky, in the remote Timansky region, the local youth came forward with a poster which, which, which declares, we struggle for human rights and democracy. We are not slaves of the Communist Party. In Estonia, even the local communist authorities decided not to have the usual October Revolution parade this year, while in Armenia, a parallel rally called by Nagorny Karabakh Committee at the same day gathered several times bigger crowd than the official meeting marking the Bolshevik Revolution. Revival of national feelings among different nations of the Soviet Union is truly remarkable. I remember at one point, uh, at one point sharing a, a prison cell with a young Lithuanian who got three years for raising Lithuanian national flag on the day of national independence. This used to be a routine event. Each year in every Baltic Republic, a group, groups of young people would raise their national flags, got caught and sentenced to three years each. Just a month ago, Lithuanian national flag was officially raised in the central square of the capital city Vilnius, while a crowd of several hundred thousands solemnly observed a minute of silence in memory of victims of communism. I am sure, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the similar events in Estonia. Moreover, most, uh, almost in, in, in each of the Soviet republics, a national democratic party is created now. There are representatives from Armenia, Georgia, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Moldova, and from the Crimean and Tartus have met in Riga at the end of September and made a joint statement among other things. It says, Considering our top priority to be a change of totalitarian political system in the Soviet Union, we will struggle to that end by all possible means, an important uh, part among which can be played by the struggle for a, democratic, for a truly democratic electoral system. We will struggle for introduction in the Soviet Union of genuine freedom of speech instead of, of a decreed glasnost. We will resist any attempt to separate our movements and to crush us one by one. Only as a united front of all oppressed nations can we achieve our goals. We appeal to all other nations, democratic, uh, national democratic movements of all other nations in the Soviet Union to join us and to become united under a slogan which has always united the oppressed nations of the world for your freedom and ours. Those are not empty words. Millions are behind them. Well, my friends, the way things are going, I might entertain you in Moscow by the year of 2000, when you will celebrate 47th, I believe, anniversary of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. <laughs> Unfortunately, these developments became very much distorted in the West. Somehow, they were ascribed to the goodwill of the current Soviet leadership, particularly that of Gr Comrade Gorbachev, who became credited with an intention of introducing a true democracy in the Soviet Union. This assessment is as ridiculous as to suggest that Jimmy Carter's intentions was to see Ronald Reagan taking his place in the White House. <laughs> All Gorbachev wanted was to improve Soviet economy by giving the people slightly more initiative and a broader participation in the task of building socialism. A steady decline of Soviet economy has finally brought the country to bankruptcy, making it impossible for the Soviet Union to maintain its superpower status, to maintain its empire, and to continue military competition with the West. He simply had no choice. But he also hoped that when the people have slightly more freedom, they, to paraphrase Mark Twain's famous saying, would have enough common sense not to use it. He hoped that fear generated by 70 years of repressions will prevent the people from, from demanding real democracy, and he was wrong. In short, we do not owe any gratitude to Comrade Gorbachev, for he did not introduce his glasnost in perestroika as a favor to us. The West should not hasten to res rescue its bankrupt enemy, should not eliminate the need for painful internal reforms by providing economic assistance to the Soviet Union and its client states, or by reducing the pressure on the military competition. Let us remember, such assistance will be a death toll for millions of Armenians and Lithuanians, 
Georgians and Estonians, for all democratic forces in the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, this seems to be the limit of the moral recovery of the West. Current Western infatuation with Gorbachev is quite ridiculous. I have read statements in the Western press which really made me either to laugh or to, to be scared. One newspaper in Britain recently described the regime under Gorbachev as Gorbachev's imperfect democracy. And I thought, well, it's probably as accurate as to say that George Schultz is imperfect Secretary of State. <laughs> simply put, simply put, the West ascribes to Gorbachev every positive aspect in the new development, while all negative aspects are squarely blamed on some mysterious conservatives in the Kremlin. For example, he gets credit for releasing some 300 political prisoners, while the fact that many hundreds still remain imprisoned never affects his reputation because this is interpreted as a limit of his power. But if this were the case, and he was too weak to release even a handful of prisoners, he must be irrelevant as just a figurehead. Why then we are so eager to negotiate with him? Shouldn't we better find those mysterious conservatives and talk to them directly? <laughs> On the other hand, if he is strong, strongly in control, why do we have to help him? As seems to be the universal craving right now. Why do we have to pay for glasnost and perestroika if he seems to believe in it? Current rate of Soviet borrowing has reached a staggering figure of seven, $700 million a month. And as if this was not enough, European banks have just made another Christmas gift of $14 billion to the Kremlin. Furthermore, there are persistent talks of creating a new Marshall Plan for Moscow. Marshall Plan for what? For building socialist pluralism promised by Gorbachev? For helping him to maintain Cuba and Nicaragua? Vietnam and Angola? Unfortunately, after living nearly 12 years in the West, I am only too aware that it is futile to try to find any logic in the Western policy toward the Soviet Union. Simply, current crisis of the Soviet system has once again revived old hopes, fears, and illusions, which long ago became in the West a substitute for, for a sober analysis. On the one hand, we are overwhelmed by those eager to, and I quote, handle the Soviet crisis and to encourage reforms by providing economic aid to Moscow. On the other hand, we are urged to use the crisis as unique opportunity to improve relations, to stop the arms race, and to live happily ever after. Needless to say, neither school of thinkers can offer a single serious argument or a fact a convincing analysis or a plausible concept of the Soviet system to justify their recipe. Nor do they try to, because ill-hidden behind their optimistic facades, there is always a plain fear. Don't make the Soviets dis desperate. An image of a mortally wounded beast with its back to wall, irrational and murderous out of desperation, is so powerful that it tends to paralyze our minds and to obliterate our memory. We tend to forget that its wounds are self-inflicted. Its desperation continues for at least 40 years. And above all, that it has always drew its horns in previously whenever pushed to the wall. Ridiculous as it may seem, this figment of our imagination still dominates our thoughts, discussions, and decisions. Yes, my friends, let us not deceive ourselves. Those billions of dollars paid ostensibly for glasnost and perestroika, those are still ransom money. I am afraid it is a bit early to celebrate our renewal or our recovery. Just at the moment when millions of Russians and Ukrainians, Armenians and Lithuanians, are prepared to fight for democracy, overcoming their 70-year-old fears, the West is paying to our common enemies. It is not really difficult to understand. Even so, for someone completely unfamiliar with the Soviet system, that Lithuanian national flag was finally raised in Vilnius, not because of a nice new leadership in Kremlin, but because of thousands of those young men who were ready to go to jail for that flag. In the same way, 
Glasnost became possible because thousands of people all these years were prepared to risk their lives for one word of truth. Freedom cannot be granted and never was. It can only be acquired through a sacrifice and a struggle. It can be earned, but it cannot be bought. And if we want to our recovery as human beings to become complete, we must help the people who struggle for freedom and not their oppressors who promised us peace.